welcome to the Scottish Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host Chris, and here we'll be delving into the multitude of strange occurrences that happen within Scotland and beyond. Contact us with your accounts at the Scottish Paranormal Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Podbean, and you can contact us by either means. Tonight's episode, we're discussing a few ghost encounters and a few UFO encounters uh, with Paul. Um, the UFO encounters date back to his early years when he stayed in Armadale, which is also my old hometown, and there's been numerous encounters and cases um, within Armadale over the years. One of the more prominent ones I podcasted about, uh, one of the recent podcasts, which was uh, the Black Triangle, uh, the Andy Swan encounter, and there's been a few few encounters in Armadale over the years in surrounding areas. The whole kind of area, an outlying area, does have quite a lot of encounters over the years, which we're podcasting about um, in future podcasts. Within Armadale as well, I, I do know people who have who've had other encounters, and myself, I had one encounter which I found pretty strange. I'll relay it with you, and you can make off it what you will. Um, I rationalised it at the time, um, but I, I did find it pretty odd though. I was at running one night, I used to run at obscure times, early in the morning or late at night, after work or before work. And I was running the cycle path, which basically, if you look from the area, um, just to give you a bit of description of it, so the cycle path basically skirts the top of the town. Um, so the other kind of side of it, it's just kind of fields and farmland and there might be some kind of woodland areas. Um, to the, If you follow it west, it goes to the next town, the next town it goes to is Blackridge, and if you go east, it will go through Bathgate. Between Armadale and Bathgate, there's probably an area about three miles, which would be farmland and such like. Um, so I was running the, the cycle path between Armadale and Bathgate, running along, and if you can imagine, it was it was, it was was quite late at night. I had a small torch on, which only cast about a, a metre or a metre and a half of light in front of you, so you could really just see the, kind of, the way your kind of feet are falling on the path. Um, it was pretty dark, but you could discern um, when you were running next to the town, you could still see streetlights and such like, but after the town, it got dark because you obviously you were into the farmland then. So I ran along the path, I left the town, and the first thing I noticed um, when I left the town, the, the first kind of large farmer's field on the left-hand side, I could see a small red light. As I was running, so I turned and looked at this red light, it looked like just a, a small red LED in the middle of the field, probably about three, four hundred metres away, roughly, maybe not even as far as that, but it was, it was a good bit away. Um, so still running, this red light, automatically, as soon as I noticed it, came hurtling towards me, um, through the field, not on, not really in the air, it was, it was near the ground, um, so it was coming towards me, and the first thing I kind of thought of was, um, it's a dog with an LED in its collar. So as I'm running, um, this thing's crossing the field, crossing the field, crossing the field, coming towards me, and I'm straining to listen to see if I could hear somebody shouting their dog, because the dog was running a good distance from where it started, or if it was a dog, but a light anyway, what I seen. Um, so I couldn't hear anybody shouting, but all I kept thinking about is I hope the bottom, the gate at the bottom, um, is going to be closed, because I don't want a, a dog attacking me if I was running and stuff at night. So I still had a good distance to go down towards where the... the the farmland kind of ended, and then you go under an underpass, and then you're going to. Um, there's more farmland after that, so it's like a road that goes over the, the top. So, as I'm running, this thing, kind of the, the light, the small LED light, um, was up at the fence line when I was running still. So it's travelling parallel with me. Um, that's another side of the fence line. I'm on the cycle path. It's roughly maybe ten meters or under away from me. Um, it was dark, but it was, you could still discern things like you see a darker fence post, you could see darker gorse bushes. So next to the fence line, on the other side of the fence line, there was like a row of kind of gorse bushes, kind of sporadic uh, the place just along the fence line. Um, the cycle path I was running on was just more slightly elevated in the field, so you could kind of see in it yeah, slightly. Um, the red LED light was roughly about the same height as the fence line, if not just slightly under it, so it was about three, three foot, three and a half foot off the ground. So I'm still running. This light is um, keeping the speed, same speed as me. 
It's gone behind the gorse bushes, in front of gorse bushes, and bobbing them between them as I'm running at the same speed as that, and uh, it's travelling me. So it ran with me for a good, probably 600 metres from the kind of start to finish, if not slightly more than that. Um, so all the way down, it was still with me all the way down, and as you get to the bottom of the field, the, the gorse bush stops and then there's maybe about another 10 metres where there's no gorse bushes and you get the gate there and stuff. So as I got down at the gate, the it went behind one of the last gorse bushes uh, and it disappeared. I turned around and I couldn't see it. So I turned around, look into the field. The field's kind of pitch black. You can see you can see the certain the gorse bushes and stuff, obviously, but I couldn't see the light anymore. I stopped to listen, just complete silence. I couldn't hear anybody shouting at a dog, anybody whistling at a dog. I couldn't hear a dog. Um, and it just kind of... Gave me a wee bit of the creeps. I was there that, that that bit of night, seeing that thing. I, I didn't know what to make it. So um, I ran into the next town, and then ran back the street lights, ran back like the street areas rather than go the cycle path again. I go back that way. Um, the thing was when I was thinking back, when I actually stopped to look back to see if I could see the light, I couldn't remember seeing a dog. I could see the. I rationalised it as a dog, um, and I told my wife that. But I always I did. I, find it strange enough to, to bring it up. But that's all I could rationalise it as some of these dogs escaped. At that time of night, it's the middle of a farmer's field and it's got a red LED on. It's colour. Usually you wouldn't see people in that field. It's usually um, cows and stuff. It's like a cattle, cattle kind of field. Um, and there's plenty of paths about, so if anybody's walking their dogs at night, they would easily be able to go on a path rather than going in the middle of a field. So I just kind of found it odd, the fact that I didn't hear anybody shouting on it. I couldn't actually see a dog anyway. All I actually seen was that small red light that just basically crossed the field a good distance and run, ran with me, basically at the same speed, bobbing in between um, the gorse bushes and it disappeared at the end. It changed my behaviour though because I never ran that way at night again and um, I bought a torch that beamed at a prominent, strong, long light um, because of that. But uh, I just found it was, it was quite a strange encounter. I mean, I, I totally rationalised it um, as it must have just been a dog escaped. We have headlight in its collar or something like that, and, but I didn't really see a dog. But uh, it came prominent to me as well when I was watching a documentary more recently. And um, I seen the same thing in a documentary, and I thought, and that's what kind of brought up. I was like, I've seen that, I've seen that same thing. So I just thought it would be a, a good beginning story to share. Um, as I've got to talk about just a few Paul's stories as well, and we've got a few more cases coming up in Armadale, um, because I'm from there, and I know a few stories on there already, but um, we'll take it from there. Alright, so we're going to go into Paul's account, so chill out, listen in, and hope all is well. I'm not sure my story, well, I know my stories are not going to be as detailed or as elaborate as anything like that. Um, it's just uh, vague memories, to tell you the truth. Um, the, 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 the first one I, I think I might have been about right and you're going to think oh you're a bit too young to be telling me stories but 11 or 12 I think was the first thing I'd seen right. and I'm trying to think of the name of the place where it was a scene because when I used to walk to um, St Anthony's I, I, I would go up past your house and I can't remember the name of the street because mm -hmm. uh, I would go past your house and head down past Paul Brady's house mm -hmm. uh, and go down and go right down to the end of the street and there's these big blocky flats oh, uh, yeah, I know, yeah, St Helen's Place that's it, St Helen's Place right. and there was a wee Asian shop uh, there and it's just as I remember we were going to chapel uh, of an evening so it must have been about half past five mm -hmm. And it, it, so it was a Sunday, and I think it was late November, beginning beginning of December. And as we were walking under, I seen what I thought was a big, and it was me, my mum, and my wee brother. I think my dad was working away somewhere. And uh, what I seen, because from there, from what I can remember, you can see. I don't know, I don't think it's there anymore. There's the old foundry. The old, ah, yeah, yeah, I know we are. No. Right. And what, what I've seen above the foundry, uh, uh, above the foundry and the wasteland, I think, did we call it the sands or something? 
can't remember. There was a, a nickname we gave it. You got the um, foundry then over that. You got the brickworks and all that kind of stuff. And the aye, but it was and... definitely that side. Aye. But um, just before you got to the foundry, there was like, um, we used to go on our bikes and go over these humps and, you know, it was definitely, I don't know. We're on motorbikes and doing wheelies and everything. I know, but I know, you the bing, I know, but you were that neck of the woods. Aye. Aye. And so, what I seen in the sky, right, was this bright orange light, really bright orange. And it was the cigar shape that I've heard people describe. So, mm -hmm. cigar sausage shape. Yeah. And it, it, the size of it was massive. Um, and it was just sitting above that area. And I would have to say that it was, I don't know, something that was really big. Uh, maybe 70 metres long or something. Mm -hmm. It's big, yeah. Um, but I, I, I'd seen it and I'm continuing walking to the chapel and I'm, I moved my head. And I looked round, and it, it, it gone. It, that 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 was it. And um, but my mum, we never spoke about it again after that. Mm -hmm. But she did see it. She did see it. Yeah, right. um, I, I think my brother might have been a bit too young to have seen it. But that that's all that one. And so it was, it was really brief, and I'd never heard any stories of anybody else seeing it. What, what age were you then? Uh, if you were, 11 or 12. I mean, so if you were 11 or 12, then what kind of year was that? 81. Because there was, there was another site in around about the same time in the early 80s. All right. Um, which is, it was either, I'm sure it was either 81, 80, so it's either 80, 81, 82. I can't, I'll need to dig into it a wee bit more. But there was a site in an Armadale um, around about the same time. Oh, right. within the years anyway and there was uh, I'm sure there was a policeman that seen it and I know of two other people who seen it who were younger um, but they've not came forward but I know they had seen it but they'd, oh, seen, right. they'd seen something different from what the police seen but they maybe just seen it at a different angle ah. they'd seen it for like a it was either like a disc shaped thing I mean but they'd, they'd seen it for like a, a lengthy bit of time but I don't know the, if the, the police had seen like a cigar shape type thing, but I'm sure it was in the papers and all that kind of stuff as well. I still need to try and dig into that story because it's it's no prominent one I knew about. Uh -huh. um, that's kind of why I was asking the date and stuff, you know what I mean? Because the time uh -huh. stuff like that. But what I seen was like a, a bright uh, orangey red. And this was broad uh -huh. daylight. No, 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 no. This, this, this would have been half past five of an evening, so it was dark. So it was dark because it was like December or November. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, so it, it was dark, and and that's all there was to that. Really, I'm sorry. It's all right. I mean, it's like it's it's, it's amazing though what you find. I mean, the uh, fact that just realising talking with you, the, the fact that you're ga gathering all these stories, that you're able to piece some of the stuff and the timelines together. That's awesome. Yeah. As I was saying with, with the Andy Swan thing, it was he's seen some recent sightings as well. I mean, because like I was talking to him and he stays up that neck of the woods now. Uh -huh. And after the end, he said, I've seen some things recently. I said, well, what have you seen? And he's he seen um, like either kind of orb-type things in the sky, like quite large. Uh -huh. And one he said it was like a, it was like a, a sphere, like a kind of bright sphere, uh -huh. um, like white, but something was going on about it. And he recorded it in his phone, he sent me the video, but it's quite hard to discern what it is, but it's definitely like it's something strange. But the interesting thing is as well, he said it went, it came from kind of Whitburn direction, went over the, like, kind of, I'm sure he said it went over like the, the, the Bafke Hills, kind of neck of the woods and dipped down and then came back up. But the interesting thing is as well, there's been other sightings in that area We the same type of kind of thing. You know what I mean, it was like some type of orb thing and somebody said it was an orb thing, it looked like it had a... Like a line of mercury going around about it. Oh, and that was that was I never heard of that story. It was the one that got told to me, but it was on like um the MUFON site. Mm -hmm. And it was on that. It was about 84, and um it was standing just outside your house, actually on your, your land, up the steps, and I think it was at like the corner of your house. Mm -hmm. And I think Sasha, it was definitely me and Sasha, and I think thought possibly your mum was there as well mm -hmm. and for some reason 
I've looked up. I don't know what the hell we were talking about, and we're talking about something, and we looked up at the stars, and um, oh, and I seen these three lights, like you know, a bit, a bit, this, this maybe the size of a star, you know, from what we can see, mm -hmm. and they, they they all came together, and originally I thought, well. They, they, they can't be satellites because I thought satellites all went round the same direction. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the lights all came together, right, to the one point, mm -hmm. all three, uh, they, they came to the one point spot on and it just disappeared. That, that, that was it. Uh, and th th there was nothing else other than, did you just see what I seen, Sasha? <laughs> So the three points of light, the individual, individually, did they look like stars each? As in, like, I thought they looked like stars each, right. mm -hmm. but I've, I've, it's gone over my head again and again over the years, and I'm thinking, was that actually some triangle thing that was changing um, its um, shape, rotating or turning or something? Aye. Aye. and and the way it's done it, the, the three points have come. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. Aye, aye, I thought yeah. That was it, really. Still uh, exciting, though. I mean, that's the thing. It's like the, the whole point is to, to try and piece all these things together, and that's like the, the point it, to try and get more people to because a lot of people didn't relay their stories. So, you know the, the I mean? thing was, it was just sheer chance we were just looking in the right direction, bizarrely looking in the same direction. It must have been something to do with being so close to the side of your house, aye, and therefore. There's only a certain part of the sky you're going to see, mm -hmm. and maybe that's what drew us up. But, you know, there was nothing else to indicate something was above us. It was just you know chatting away and looking up. And did you see that? Yeah. Can you see that? But, we, uh, we had one where it was like uh, we were fishing one night, and I've relayed this in one of the podcasts, and it's just a, a satellite type thing. But we'd seen. Um, we were fishing at the Lily Lock, like further out towards um, Calder Crooks. Oh. And it was like dark, it was at night, you could see the stars out and all that kind of stuff. And we seen a satellite and you're like, kind of following a satellite going through the sky. And it was about the same size of a normal kind of satellite as you would see them. And it was coming towards a kind of brighter star. And it was just, oh. we basically, and I think one of you said, or I had said, I wonder what it's going to do when it hits that star, like as a joke. And it got to the star and it just done a total 90 degree turn. It just, it, it, it just, it didn't the arc or nothing. It was going to, it was going to pass through it, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's what you probably don't expect to do. As soon as it hit that star, we were waiting on it. Just went and totally went the opposite angle. I mean, like mad. You know what I mean, so satellites didn't do that. No, but definitely not. Definitely not. Um, I've I've got a couple of other stories, but they're nothing to do with you. No, that's all right. I mean, anything. I mean, that's fine. And uh, basically, uh, um, I I lived in uh, Birmingham. Uh, South Birmingham uh, in a place called Longbridge. You might have heard of it. It's where Land Rover and Rover mm. and all that was based. And I, I worked in a pub there called the King George V. And I think it had been built in the 40s or something. And it was a massive pub. The uh, the downstairs lounge could hold about, uh, I think it was about 200 people. The bar could hold about 100 people. There were two function rooms. One could hold 60 and the other function room could hold 150. And uh, it was uh, run by uh, a guy called Bill Gregory who worked for Mitchell's and Butler's Brewery. And so their living accommodation was upstairs as well. But anyway, the thing was, I'd finished uh, going to college. I think I'd finished going to college. And I, I was actually the head barman there. And I was homesick for, you know, living in Scotland, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I lived with my parents in Longbridge, my mum, dad and my brother. And I was, I was really homesick, although, you know, I've lived with the family. I thought, I don't like living down here. I just want to get back up to mm -hmm. Scotland. So anyway, everybody knew I'd, I'd decided I was leaving. Um, and I was going to come up to Scotland and um, find a job and settle in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, one of the last times 
that um, I worked there. Oh, perhaps I should tell you the story before. <laughs> uh, now, I'll continue. I'll jump backwards with the other one. Um, it was a lunchtime, and um, the, the pubs had shut shuts at half two, I think it was. So shut half two and get rid of everybody from the pub, right, including all the bar stuff. So I'm the head barman. It's the gaffer's day off, and I'm cashing up. I've locked everything, and I'm in, in the bar, uh, counting the money in the till. And, what, and there was nobody about, absolutely nobody in the pub. It was only me. And all I heard was a woman's voice just over my left shoulder said, where are you going? And I've, I, I stood back from the till and I thought, what, what the hell was that? I was, hmm. Who's there? Somebody there? And I went through and I, I checked the toilets and that and there was nobody there. And I, I was so frightened, I tell you. I thought, I need to get out of here. I do, I'm not comfortable. I've heard something and it spoke to me. And I thought, right, box, I'm not counting the rest of this till. I just chucked it on the, the left to send it upstairs, straight up, off the left, chucked it into the office. I thought, count that when I open up later. Was this half two in the morning? Was it early in the morning or was it? Oh, this is half two in the afternoon. In the afternoon, all right. In the afternoon. Um, so I, I did that. Uh, I went home and I had to come back and open up at night time about half past five. But I come, I come back and I thought, I'm not going in this pub unless somebody's with me. Because <laughs> it's a big old pub. And I, I waited for a member of the staff. But basically, I, I put it down as that the ghost was trying to communicate with me, a female ghost, to tell me I was doing, I think maybe tell me I'm doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Where are you going? How close How close was the voice to your, your head? Just like an earshot, right? Ear just over my left shoulders as though there was a, a head right there mm -hmm. but it wasn't a loud voice it was a where are you going mm -hmm. and, it, and it was oh it really eerie and, and I, I put it down to the fact that I came to Scotland it didn't work out and I went back again mm -hmm. and I think the ghost was trying to tell me maybe it's not a good idea mm, it's bad. <laughs> but it was, that was it but that, that wasn't the only uh, thing related to a ghost in that pub. And um, there was another time I was working in the bar. Same place, exact same room, actually. Mm -hmm. And this time there was a disco in, in the lounge and I'm working in the bar. And what I felt, it wasn't a voice or anything. It was just as though somebody had whacked me on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I turned around and, and I went, where the was that? Mm. I know nobody had come through the door behind me that led to the lounge mm -hmm. because you would hear uh, the door open and you would hear the music get louder. Yeah, yeah. And also I knew it wouldn't be the uh, cellar. However, I went up, the cellar was up, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, I went up to the cellar just to du double check that nobody had played a prank on me mm -hmm. and nobody there. Smart. I mean, so that, that, that was my two experiences of that one. I've got a, a friend called Mick the Fish, and he used to come and do the cleaning of the pipes at the pub on a Sunday morning. And um, so basically, you, you draw all the beer out the pipes, uh, get the water through them, and you start putting the clean solution through. So he would come uh, about eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, because it's a big job with the four rooms and there's a lot of uh, beer in the pipes mm -hmm. and a lot of beer on the tap. And and he was he was doing it and he was up in the, the function room, the small function room, and he had just come up the stairs from the lounge and there started drawing some of the stuff through the pipes and he's got the bucket uh, and turned around and went, oh, all right, love, how are you? I had seen an old lady mm -hmm. behind the curtain and he turned his head, finished doing what he was doing 
And he turned around again and she was gone. Madness. I mean, was she, uh, did he get a description of what she looked like? He, he elderly. Mm-hmm. She was elderly. Um, and he actually had thought it was the, uh, the mother of the landlady, one lord's wife. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he spoke to him, the, the, the gaffer later. He says, Oh, I, I see you've got the mother in law with you. He went, No. <laughs> he goes, But I've just spoke to her upstairs. He went, No, she's not here. So there was nobody. So the only people who'd been upstairs was Mick cleaning the pipes, uh, landlord and his missus, nobody else. So did, did the landlord stay there? Yes, he stayed on, there. On premise. Did he ever uh, report anything staying there in the place? No, but his um, his ch- his grandchildren uh, stayed there, and they actually stayed in the room that was closest to the the, the small function room. So the same place where Mick the fish had seen uh, the the ghost, and they were staying in that room because there was no functions, and uh, and his daughter was there, and. Uh, his her husband and um the, the children got upset in the of the night when the mother came up and the, i think they were crying from what i recall and she's oh what's wrong what's wrong uh they goes we'll we'll oh, right we liked the children we seen but we didn't like how they just walked through the door without opening it. <laughs> and I think it was a couple of children they had seen. Mm-hmm. So th- there was that. That's crazy. I mean, the, the place where it was built, I mean, what was the kind of history of it? I mean, if it was built in the 40s, you know what I mean? Or was it older than that? Or was that... I think it was built in the 40s because um, I remember there was a couple of customers used to brag about being the first ones ever to drink in the place. So oh, right, yeah. They were quite elderly. Um, but I don't know what it was built on. It was it was built on the, the Bristol Road South um, on the corner of Tessel Lane. But I, I, I don't know the history there at all. I, I'd need to have a, a dig to see if there was anything else there. Mm-hmm. But the, the fact that a handful of us who knew each other had these different experiences. Mm. It was, I'll actually ask, I've got a friend uh, who used to work with, I'll, I'll need to ask her if she had heard any stories. Mm-hmm. But they all heard my story because <laughs> they, they, they all knew I, I, I was, uh, it, it um, spooked me big still. <laughs> I thought, God, what the hell is going on? Uh, but, but that's it. I, with regards to some other things, uh, um, I'm, I'm in contact with the people I went to school with. We've got a sort of a Facebook group uh, mm-hmm. where somebody just drops a, a message and everybody can see it. Mm-hmm. I'll ask about if they've heard of any stories, if there's anything they've got. Aye, that'd be good. Interest to you. Aye, totally. Um, go, going back to your the the Kerry first encounter you had with uh, with your mum, you, what was the Kerry? Thought at the time, I know, like you said, your mum's seen it. You never, they never spoke about it after. Like, was there? A, you think there was a reason why you never spoke about it? As a common theme, when people see these things, they, they don't speak about it, and it's no, it's it's not even down to the ridicule aspect to or anything like that. It's like they just don't even speak about it between themselves or, or and, and stuff like that as well. It's it's quite odd. I think she tried to sweep it under the carpet, um, and she'd made a couple of comments. At, at that time, and it was, or oh, maybe it's a firework, or it's something to do with the foundry. Some fire come mm-hmm. out of the foundry, but it wasn't fire coming out of the foundry. It was something that was above the foundry and, and over that sandy area as well. Ah, like an object, aye. But she did try and sweep it under the carpet. You know, mm-hmm. uh, dismiss it as as much as possible. I'll, I'll I'll find out when I find out when the dates were of the other one because I'm sure. I'm sure there was, as I said, there was a site and it was early 80s anyway. Um, I'm in contact with one of my friends who basically, him and his brother seen it as well, but they didn't really, I don't think they, they came out and relayed anything. They were quite young at the time, but they definitely seen it. 
and it was just as I was saying, it was, it was the same thing that the, the police guys had seen. Or I don't know if it's one police policeman or two, but I'm sure it was in the courier and stuff. So I, it's one of the ones that I, I never really heard about because I heard about most of this the kind of stories. Um, and the, the most prominent ones, like you had ones where the Bob Taylor case, um, the one in Livingston, and you had the guys in the A70. My, my my interest is going massive again, and and here and you, I could sit here for months, uh, listening <laughs> listening to you. I'm going to be catching up on all those podcasts, um, but it makes me wonder the, uh, some other countries, and I think I wonder if these other countries have had sightings. Like my, my wife's Albanian, right, mm -hmm. and I've never heard her ever mention uh, about any sightings of UFOs in Albania. Um, I've not asked her. I'm going to be ans asking her now, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's, it's just a daft wee question I had. You do get it. It was a communist country for a uh, till about 1984 or something. I think mm -hmm. it was 85, maybe later. And uh, so they they had the the little bunkers, you know, a hundred, nearly a hundred thousand bunkers or something mad like that all over the countryside. I remember when I first visited the place, I went, what the hell was that? <laughs> oh, Enver Hodger had uh, told everybody that they'd got to build these, that the outside world wanted to come and take everything away from what they had got. Nice. But, but I'm wondering if there's... I'm going to be asking that question anyway. There will be. There is, there is ones in Russia and Poland and, and all that. I know there's cases here, so potentially there will be. Um, I'd like to keep in contact with you, Chris, if you, if you don't mind. No, um, definitely. And I'll, as I'm saying, I'll send you a couple of links and stuff as well and, and get a look at it and see what you think, you know what I mean? No, that's, that's awesome. Thanks very much for having a listen. Like I said, it wasn't the much you had, but if I can dig with some of my old friends and see if they've got anything, because they're all most of them are still in the Armadale area. I've got loads of cousins in West Lothian as well, as you see. So... There might be something else there that they've heard, you know, and be able to pass on the information to you to get the right person so you can talk to them one to one. No, I totally. Right, well, listen, well, everything counts, not I mean. So, like, thanks very much for your time. No, any, any time. Um, I'll talk to you soon. I'll be looking out for that that stuff you're going to send. Send it to the new. All right. <laughs> you take care. Right, you take care. Catch you later. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.